Chapter 10 Did you two have a fight or something? Caden asked. What do you mean? Kelly frowned. She was a terrible liar and hoped he wouldn't ask anything that she wasn't prepared to talk about. You two were all googly-eyed at each other and now you are avoiding one another, Caden supplied as he munched on a cookie. We are working through some stuff, Kelly improvised. Is it anything we can help with? Cece asked. Not really. Kelly smiled at them. What are you guys studying in school lately? She changed the subject. Caden shared a look with Cece. Cece nodded. She must think we're not mature enough to handle it. I am right here. Kelly raised an eyebrow. Oh, good! You heard us! Cece cocked her head to the side. Want to unburden yourself and hear the wisdom of eleven-year-olds? Hey, I'm almost twelve, Caden protested. Seriously, though, we give good advice. Kelly sighed. It probably couldn't hurt. Hit me with it. Okay, what is the underlying problem? If you don't know the problem, you can't fix it, Caden said wisely. I'm not sure what the exact problem is. Your dad won't talk about it, Kelly said truthfully. Then you need to talk to him and find out what it is, Cece licked her spoon. That seems reasonably simple, Kelly allowed. The answers to problems usually are, Caden added his opinion. You should go talk to him. Right now? Kelly was surprised. No use waiting, Cece replied. It only gets harder to do the longer you leave it. When did the two of you get so smart? Kelly shook her head in amazement. Caden shrugged. I think we have always been smart. That was modest, Cece laughed. He smiled sheepishly. That's why I hang out with you, to keep me humble. Go bug him, Cece waved Kelly away with a shooing motion. Wish me luck. Kelly put down her mug and headed to Dylan's home office. She knocked on the door before simply letting herself in. I was wondering if you wanted any hot chocolate. I made some for the kids. Not particularly. Dylan was distracted by a spreadsheet. Thanks for asking. Kelly closed the door behind her. We should talk. There is nothing to talk about, he continued looking at the screen of his computer. I'm busy right now. There's lots to talk about. Kelly took a deep breath. For instance, if we win the custody case, then what happens afterward? I thought it would be fairly obvious, he said disinterestedly. It's not obvious to me, and I would like to know your thoughts about it, she said firmly. Dylan sighed and tore his gaze away from the computer to look at her. Our living arrangement should probably stay the same for six months or so. Then we can quietly separate. After a year or two, we can obtain a divorce. A divorce, Kelly breathed. She felt like she had just hit that tree again. Yes. Dylan cleaned his glasses on the edge of his shirt. As we live in a no-fault state, you will receive half my assets. You will be able to care for Bentley financially, and there won't be any problems with the Islingtons trying for custody again. I don't want your money, Kelly said faintly. Since we didn't sign a prenup, the court is going to award it to you, he stated evenly. I said... I don't want it, Kelly repeated. I'm not going to take it. You don't really have a choice, Dylan said tiredly as he put his glasses back on. Actually, I do, she replied. I will just sign the contract your dad brought out when we met. Although I will ask for some alterations such as not getting a single dime from you, plus generous repayment terms. Like you said, it's going to take me past retirement to pay back what you paid it off for me. Kelly, you don't need to pay me back, Dylan automatically said. He was angered by what his father had done. He wanted you to sign a contract? He loves you, Dylan. He wanted to protect you from gold-digging women like me. Kelly had a bitter laugh. The Islingtons didn't exactly give your dad a glowing report of their former daughter-in-law. You are not a gold digger. I know that. I don't want your money, Kelly sniffed. She blinked rapidly, trying to hold it together. She didn't want to cry right now. All I wanted was to be a good mom to Bentley, to your kids, to be a good wife, to believe that we might have been speaking the truth when we said those vows in front of the judge. I guess that was too much to ask for. 
It's unfair to ask that when you're just pushed into it, when you didn't want to be married to me. Kelly. Dylan stood, but he stopped when Kelly held out a hand to ward him off. Please don't. She shook her head and flashed him a brilliant smile. It's fine. I'll figure it out. Thanks for helping as long as you have. She didn't wait to hear what he had to say, but left the office as quickly as she could. Hey, guys. Kelly flashed Caden and Cece a bright smile. Would you mind keeping an eye on Bentley and Avery? Your dad is still in his office if you need him. Okay, Caden agreed. How did it go with Dad? Perfect, Kelly lied as she kept her smile firmly in place. Thanks for your help. Any time. Caden watched her grab her bag and get her coat. He turned to Cece. That went super bad. Do you think we should interfere? Cece asked. Yup. Caden got off his chair. He grabbed two cookies and went to Dylan's office. He didn't bother to knock, but let himself in and plopped down in one of the extra chairs. Caden tossed a cookie onto the desk. What's this about? Dylan looked at Caden. He wasn't in the best of moods after the confrontation with Kelly. He had known he was going to hurt her. What he hadn't expected was how much he hurt as well out of the process. That is probably the last homemade gingerbread cookie you will ever get, Caden said. Cece came and sat down in a chair as well, watching curiously. Why do you say that? Dylan shut the laptop to look at his son. Kelly made them. Caden bit into his cookie. I don't know what you said to her, but she is upset. Caden, we are not going to discuss this. Dylan frowned. Sure we are, Caden said easily. This affects us as a family. If you keep upsetting Kelly and make her want to leave, then what is Avery going to do? Avery will be fine, Dylan said firmly. They all would be. Caden snorted. I noticed you didn't protest that she might leave. Caden, this is between Kelly and I. Dylan stood. I have work to do, and you should get your own homework done. I know you have been avoiding your art project. Like you're avoiding the real issue right now? Caden jumped to his feet. Bentley and Avery have bonded, Dad. If Bentley leaves, it's going to hurt Avery badly. Not only that, but we all know Kelly can't afford Livingston Academy. By the end of the school year, she and Bentley would be out of our lives for real if you made her leave. But she's good for us, Dad. They make the house feel like a home. Caden, let the adults handle this. Dylan knew it wasn't really an answer, but he wanted his son to stop. Let the adults? Caden said in disgust. You'll just make a mess out of it like you already have. That's enough, Dylan said sharply. You should apologize to her, Caden insisted. Otherwise, she will leave and we will all just go back to being sad like after Shannon died. Dylan watched Caden stomp out of the office. Was that what he was pushing them towards? Sadness? Dylan had thought he would be protecting them. What if he was doing them more harm instead? Cece picked up the cookie and offered it to him. They really are good cookies. He took it automatically. I will go check on the boys, Cece said. Kelly left for a while. I'm not sure when she'll be back. Kelly left? Dylan focused on Caden's friend and tried to ignore the frisson of panic the thought produced. It was what he wanted, wasn't it? Did she say where she was going? No, Cece shrugged. Bentley is still here, so she will be back. Dylan waited until Cece had left before shutting the office door again. He grabbed his cell phone and called Max. He needed some advice. Kelly knocked on Tiana's door. She desperately wanted someone to talk to. She had managed to keep from crying during the cab ride over, but was perilously close to it now. Kelly knocked again and hoped that Tiana was home and not picking up an extra shift at the nursing home. Patrick opened the door. He took one look at her and yelled over his shoulder, Mom, it's another one. Kelly took off her coat, forcing a smile. Hi, Patrick. Hey. He hung her coat up for her as Tiana came into the entryway. Kelly, Tiana frowned. I wasn't expecting you. Is it a bad time? Kelly kept her smile desperately in place. If it is, I could come back. Well, I'm kind of busy. Bex is having a small crisis. Tiana was throwing a bit of attitude Kelly's way. Kelly frowned. She wondered why the two of them hadn't contacted her. Can I help? I don't know. Do you have time for your old friends? What with your new, rich lifestyle? Tiana said coldly. I don't understand why you're angry with me, Kelly said softly. 
Maybe because you have barely talked to me since you married Mr. Rich Guy? Tiana posed the rhetorical question. Thanks for dropping us, some friend you have been. I have been trying to sort out custody stuff for Bentley. Plus, you have been working extra hours, Kelly tried to explain. I have texted you. I know I called a couple of times, but it went to voicemail. Whatever, Tiana said. I think you should go. Be with your rich friends or whatever you are doing lately. Is that Kelly? Bex asked from the living room. Tiana, you were my best friend. Kelly couldn't believe what she was hearing. We were supposed to have each other's backs. Really? I don't think you need me anymore. Don't rich people have perfect lives? Asked Tiana sarcastically. Kelly! Bex came forward and hugged her before bursting into tears. I'm pregnant. Kelly automatically hugged Bex. Wow, Bex, that's amazing. Really? She sniffed. Well, Tomlin will make a great dad. Have you talked to Bo or Derek? Maybe they know a way to get in contact with him and he can come home for you. Privately, Kelly wondered at that possibility. Men didn't have a great track record of doing the right thing lately, in her opinion. That's a good idea. Bex let Kelly go. I knew you would think of something. Kelly pasted on a smile. I need to go, but call me, okay? Bex nodded. Thanks, Kelly. No problem. She looked at Tiana, who was studying her nails. Bye, Tiana. Tiana didn't say anything, so Kelly grabbed her coat and left. She made it to the stairwell, going a floor down before she sat down on the stairs. She buried her head in her hands and started a checklist in her head. Kelly needed to get a job ASAP any job, so that she could start saving first and last rent. She needed a new bank account to put her new earnings in so she could give Dylan back the money in the bank account he had given her. All of it, including Bentley's education fund and the gold card. Kelly had to call Derek to let him know of this new development so they would be able to help mount an appropriate defense with the lawyer. For now, she would stay with Dylan to keep her son. However, six months after the verdict, she was done. He wanted her gone. She would go. Kelly would need to find some place, some time to break down properly and grieve the brokenness inside of her. Her heart was shattered from more than one breakup. Maybe she had just wished things with Dylan, but it didn't make it any less hurtful that he didn't want her. Tiana's rejection hurt just as bad. It was also time to stop lying about Christopher. It never had been a great love match as he hadn't wanted her either. She'd been stupidly in love. He had wanted childish revenge on his parents, a last rebellion against Margaret and Terence. He had smoothed his way into Kelly's heart and used her to make his parents angry. He admitted it during his last days, asking for her forgiveness. Kelly was sick of pretending his memory was unblemished. While she would never say anything to Bentley, she was done of hiding it from everyone else. Pretending never got her anywhere. No one wanted her except her son. It was time to just face the fact. She wasn't good enough for anyone. Look where she came from, an alcoholic, drugged-out mother, and who knew who for a father. Just because she was desperate to fill the holes inside of her with love didn't mean that Dylan, Tiana, or anyone else did love her. In fact, these rejections proved it. She had Bentley. It would be enough until someday he grew up and grew away from her. Kelly had no illusions that if she was pregnant with Dylan's child, that he would let her keep it. It would be another custody battle that she would lose. Maybe she was an unfit mother, Kelly thought with some despair. The judge and everyone seemed to think so. The thought hurt. She had done everything she could to be the best mother she could be, and she had failed. She held back a sob. She didn't have time to break down right now. There was too much to do. Plus, she would look a fright and scare Bentley if she went on a crying jag. Hey, Patrick sat down beside her. Hey, Kelly took a deep breath. She dropped her hands to her knees and straightened up. Sorry about that, Patrick. You shouldn't have had to see your mom argue with me. She's jealous of you, you know. Patrick shrugged. She thinks you've got a perfect life now. Kelly had a hollow laugh. It's not perfect, believe me. I know, he said simply. People have the same issues, insecurities, problems, no matter how poor or rich they are. You are a smart kid, Patrick. Kelly bit her lip, focusing on the pain to stop any tears. If she bit any harder, she was going to draw blood. She's just hurt, he sighed. She will get over it. I'll talk to her.
Kelly shrugged. It's okay. I'll be fine. You need to stop lying, Patrick advised. You're really bad at it. I know. She forced a smile and gave him a quick, hard hug. I have got to go. Okay. He watched her get up. Hey, Kelly? Yeah? I know that life is mostly unfair, but we all get through it one step at a time, okay? Because she couldn't trust herself to speak, Kelly nodded and gave him the best of a smile that she could. She gave him a quick wave and headed down the stairs. Her first order of business was to go to another employment agency. She would do seasonal. She would serve coffee. She would bag groceries. Whatever they had, Kelly was ready. It wasn't like she had any other choice. She also needed to get a pregnancy kit. Kelly needed to know for certain so she could determine what to do with her future. At the convenience store, she spotted a help-wanted sign and wasted no time in talking to the owner. It wasn't what she was trained for, but she had done some retail in the past while she was paying for her living expenses during her college days. The owner promised to give her a chance. Kelly had an internal sigh of relief. One thing done. Next, she grabbed some quick items in the kit. She assured the owner it was for a friend. The last thing she needed was it counting against her that she might be pregnant, and him deciding not to employ her just because he would need to replace her in eight months or less for maternity to leave. After hitting the library to post her resume on some job sites, Kelly decided to go home and face the inevitable. She needed to pee on the stick. Even as she took a cab, she vowed to pay Doan back every cent that she spent of his. It was only right. Back at the house, Kelly tossed the pregnancy kit she had bought into the drawer and shut it. There was no point in taking it. She had started her monthly as soon as she stepped in the door, making the kit useless to her. More money wasted. As much as she adored babies and children, she had to admit she was relieved. This would not have been a good time to bring another life into the world. Kelly started training for her new job tomorrow at noon. It wasn't glamorous. It paid only minimum wage. Hopefully, it would be enough to pay the bills when she found a place. If not, she would be back with her mom and stepdad. As it was, she would keep trying to upgrade. It might be a tough job market, but there had to be something out there that would benefit from her skills. Kelly wondered how long it would be before the Islingtons set another court date after they lost the appeal, or if they were allowed to. She would have to ask Derek if they could just continue to hound her until they won. If Kelly were forced to live with Meredith, the Islingtons probably would win. Was there any point in delaying the inevitable? Would it be better if she just tried to negotiate some visitation hours for herself before giving custody of Bentley over to Margaret and Terence? Kelly grabbed her phone and waited for Derek to pick up. Kelly, the dragon is angry today, so let's try to keep it brief. Derek's voice was muffled. If the Islingtons lose the appeal, can they still file for custody again? She asked. If the circumstances of Bentley have changed, such as an undesirable living habitat, or if you became an unfit parent, yes, they could. That's not going to happen, though, so why are you asking? He questioned. It will never end unless I give up custody, Kelly said softly and sat down on the bed. Can I get more favorable visitation terms if I settle out of court? Of course, but you are not going to settle. Derek's voice became more pronounced as he shifted the phone. You are going to win. You're Mrs. Ramsley now. You've got this in the bag. Kelly had a hollow laugh. He wants to quietly separate and divorce after the custody appeal is done. So I'm still screwed. Derek growled. Let me talk to him. There's no point. I'm not going to stay where I'm not wanted. Kelly swallowed hard. I would like you to draw up an agreement with the best visitation hours you can get me. Kelly, no. Think about this, he protested. There's nothing else I can do. I might keep Bentley for another few months, but ultimately, they are going to take him from me. Kelly wiped away a tear. I should just cooperate now and get visitation. Otherwise, I might get nothing. I can't go through life not seeing my son. Kelly, we can fight this. We'll get you a better lawyer. On whose money? Dylan's? No. I won't be able to pay him back as it is. Kelly's voice wobbled. Just draw up the papers. Kelly hung up on Derek's protests. She curled up into a ball on the bed and cried her heart out. Want to blow something up? 
Max asked with a grin. We've got it set up for later today. If you stick around, you can press the button. Dylan shook his head. He hadn't come to Max's job site expecting to help with the demolition work. He had come for his cousin's advice. What Dylan needed was a sounding board to tell him where he was going wrong. Now he was wearing a hard hat and touring with Max the grounds of an old derelict building the city wanted gone to make way for new construction. I was hoping to talk to you, Dylan said. Max groaned. Please tell me it's not about our insurance premiums. They're soaring each year, even with our unblemished track record of no accidents. No, he shook his head. It's about Kelly. Kelly? Max questioned. Since when are you seeing someone? Dylan showed his cousin the wedding ring. I married her? Whoa, and you didn't invite me? Max pressed a hand over his heart. I am wounded. It was a sudden thing. Dylan ignored Max's antics. Vegas? No, Dylan sighed. Can we go somewhere quieter? Sure thing. Max led the way through the noise and machinery. They were finishing clearing away a small building before the larger one was set to come down with carefully placed explosives. Max brought Dylan to a trailer which contained a bunch of filing cabinets, some chairs, a table with some coffee items on it, and an old beat-up desk. Welcome to my office. Dylan tried not to smile and failed. What a difference from Max's office when he used to work the family business of Ramsley Pharmaceutical. While Max's office at Ramsley had been upscale and professional, this office was messy, used by the crew, and had personal photos of Max's family. Nice. Hey, don't knock the office. I decorated it myself. Max grabbed a coffee. Help yourself and tell me all your woes. Max's therapy is in service. Dylan rolled his eyes and poured himself a coffee. Are these cups even clean? Since when have you become the snob? Remember in Dubai? We drank out of cups made of grass and mud. At least, I hope it was mud. Max sat down and put his feet up on the desk. What's really going on? I got married, Dylan sighed as he sat down. You already mentioned that. Who is she? What's she like? Max sipped his coffee. Her name is Kelly Islington. Her son Bentley and Avery are friends. I barely know her, Dylan frowned into his cup before setting it aside. Kelly Islington. Sounds familiar. Max arched an eyebrow. She was a nurse at Mercy Hospital. She helped when Michael had surgery, Dylan said dryly. Little nurse Kelly, Max nodded. I remember her now. You married her? She was about to lose custody of her son, Bentley. Dylan explained the whole mess from getting kidnapped, which Max roared in laughter over, to the current state of his marriage, which Max grew sober over. I thought I could protect myself and the boys from the pain of Kelly and Bentley's leaving. I mean, it was just a marriage of convenience to ensure that she got to keep her son. She was going to leave at some point anyways. You have some seriously screwed up logic, Max stated. The longer she stays, then the more we will want them to stay, Dylan tried to explain again. It makes sense to have them leave sooner rather than later, so it won't be as painful. Am I doing the right thing? No. Max answered. You are not very bright. Thanks, Dylan said dryly. First, you came to me for advice, which was a bad idea. What you want is validation for what you have already decided to do. And since I am the guy who is happily married, I'm not about to give you any validation because your plan sucks. My advice for you is to stop doing silly things. You slept with her, so you have feelings for her. Max waited for Dylan to agree. Maybe, he sighed. Okay, fine, I have feelings for her. In my defense, I tried not to. She obviously has feelings for you, or she wouldn't be sleeping with you or be upset by your rejecting her. Max took another sip of coffee. I didn't reject her, Dylan grimaced. Really? Because you told her you wanted to divorce her. I would say that's a pretty big rejection. It was the logical thing to do. We barely know each other. There's no way a marriage like this could work, Dylan insisted. Marriages of convenience happen all over the world. Just because it's not common in North America doesn't mean that they aren't sometimes successful. Max raised an eyebrow. Seems to me your logic is flawed. 
You want to protect yourself from losing her, so you are pushing her away, thus doing the very thing you were worried about happening. You are going to lose her if you keep this up. What if she dies? Dylan asked suddenly. Then she does. Max put down the coffee and sat up. No one can protect anyone from that. You know that better than anyone I know. But have you asked yourself, what if she lives, and you miss out on living and enjoying life with her? What about the moments of joy and happiness that you could have? Are you going to toss them away because you are afraid? Maybe she will outlive you. Who can say? It's a huge risk, Dylan sighed. Max shrugged. Life is a huge risk. You're in insurance. You know that no one can protect against all the risks. All we can do is decide if the reward is worth it. Max was right, although Dylan hated to admit it. He was about to say as much and ask for advice on how to fix things when his phone began to ring. Hello? What did you do? Derek demanded. Excuse me? Dylan frowned. She's going to give up custody of Bentley in return for visitation rights. Derek growled. All because someone said something about divorce? What was that all about? Are you actually going to keep your word and help Kelly keep her son, or are you flaking on us because it's not fun for your rich boy self anymore? What's the deal, Dylan? I didn't know, Dylan replied. She didn't tell me that. Why would she? She thinks you want her out of your life, Derek pointed out. That's not true. Dylan felt anxiety as he said it, but he knew he didn't want to lose Kelly. You had better talk to her, Derek said. She's not answering her phone right now. Dylan felt a fissure of panic at the thought. I will get back to you. He ended the call. For a moment, he felt the same helplessness that had invaded him after Wren had taken her own life. Kelly thought she was losing her son. What if she had done something to herself? Dylan, you okay? Max was looking concerned. I'm fine. I need to go, Dylan stood. I will drive you. Max got to his feet. You look paler than a ghost right now. You don't need to, he protested weakly. The room was slanting a little, and he forced himself to drag in a deep breath. Kelly wouldn't harm herself. She had Bentley to think about. Wren had had Shannon, Caden, and an unborn child to think about, but that hadn't stopped her. I'm driving, Max insisted. He grabbed a set of keys, and they got into a company truck that had seen better days. Max started the ignition. Where to? Home, Dylan swallowed and hoped everything was fine. He knew he was probably being irrational. Kelly was probably fine. The thought didn't make him any less tense or worried. He wondered if he should call the police for a wellness check. Max and he were at least a half hour away from the house. Anything could happen in that time. Dylan, I know this might be a bit sensitive, but did you do any therapy after Ren's death? Max stopped for a red light. Dylan gave a bitter laugh. Therapy didn't seem to help Wren much. Wren wasn't well, Max reminded Dylan gently. And you still have issues regarding her death that maybe a therapist could help you get through? Dylan ignored Max and tried calling Kelly. It went through to voicemail. He left a terse message for her to call him immediately. It was the best he could do right now since his nerves were a little frayed. Dylan, Kelly isn't Wren. She's okay, Max assured him. She's a pretty strong little lady. She's been through a lot lately. Dylan felt some relief when the light turned green and they were traveling again. He knew that a lot of what she was currently going through was his fault. He had made her think that she couldn't win a custody battle without him, that she would lose her son. She had to be devastated to give up. You really are an idiot, Max shook his head with a low whistle. What? Dylan glared at his friend and cousin. He didn't really appreciate Max disparaging him when he was in the middle of worrying for Kelly's safety. You love her, Max stated confidently. You love her and you are trying to push her away. That's the dumbest thing I have ever heard. You should be doing everything in your power to convince her to stay. Max, could you keep your eyes on the road and just drive? Dylan requested through clenched teeth. Nope. I like to give my opinion when I can, Max said calmly as he negotiated the traffic. I recommend flowers, groveling, foot massages, groveling, apologizing profusely. And did I mention groveling? 
Groveling is a good technique for getting back into a lady's good graces. However, try to avoid the situation that would require groveling in the first place. That's a good tip, too. Dylan ignored Max and tried calling Kelly again. It went straight to voicemail, so he knew that she had shut off her phone. Or her phone was broken. Wren's cell phone had been broken. Dylan closed his eyes and tried to breathe evenly against the images that his brain produced. He didn't want to remember. Max kept up a cheerful banter before pulling up in front of Dylan's house. We are here. I can't go in. Dylan stared down at his hands at the cheap ring from the courthouse. Dread had settled into his chest. Max looked at his friend in sympathy. Okay, I'm going to take my keys from the truck. I'll need your keys to unlock the front door. I'm going to have a look around. Dylan nodded and handed Max his keys. If you find her, you need to look for a pulse. Dill, she's fine. Max tried to assure him. He put a hand on Dylan's shoulder. She might be upset, maybe even angry, but she's good. Do you know first aid? Dylan asked as he continued to study his wedding ring. Yeah, I'm certified for the job site. Max gave Dylan's shoulder a squeeze. You will see that all you're worrying is for nothing. Max left Dylan in the truck. He resolved to get Dylan to agree to see a therapist. It was obvious that he was in need of help. He searched the house and found Kelly curled up in a ball, sleeping in the middle of the bed in the master bedroom. Max knocked on the door frame. Kelly blinked and rubbed her face. Good morning, Max drawled, even though it was afternoon. Max? Kelly sat up and frowned. What are you doing here? I'm here to impart invaluable advice. Max sat down in the room's armchair. Dylan was worried about you. Why? she asked, riling. Max sighed. You weren't answering your phone. So? Kelly didn't mean to sound like a belligerent child, but she felt a little like one. She twisted the wedding band on her finger and then pulled it off. I wanted to take a nap without interruptions. Taking off the ring was a bad sign in Max's opinion. What did he tell you about Wren? He said she died before Avery was born. She was on life support until Avery could be okay. Kelly wiped her eyes. They still felt gritty after all the crying she had done. He said she was depressed a lot. Wren jumped out of that window, Max pointed. It's not very far from the ground, but there used to be a big cement planter out there. Her skull was broken and her brain irreparably damaged. It wasn't the first time she tried to harm herself. Dylan found her. He did CPR on her because she had a pulse. He's the one who insisted the paramedic continue life-saving measures. He saved Avery's life, Max said softly. I didn't know, Kelly whispered. He doesn't talk about it, and that's a problem. Honestly, he could use some therapy, Max grimaced. He's out in the truck right now, worried you have hurt yourself because you weren't answering your phone. He thought I would harm myself, she frowned. I would never do that. Dylan doesn't exactly have the best frame of reference for what's normal in a marriage, Max pointed out. He also has some flawed judgment. He thought he was protecting himself and the boys by pushing you away. He is afraid loving again because he was such a mess after Ren and Shannon died. He's scared that if he loves you and you leave or die, he will go through the same process again. How did Shannon die? There were some complications from a drug that she was on for her diabetes. It was a slow process, Max sighed. He says he wants to separate and later divorce. Kelly fiddled with her wedding band. No, he doesn't. He's in love with you. In fact, I bet if you go out to the truck right now, he will recant that divorce talk pretty quick. Max stood and stretched. I'm going to go raid your kitchen. You should go and make sure he knows you're okay. Kelly watched him head out of the bedroom. She fiddled with her ring a moment longer, then put it back on before washing her face. She decided to follow Max's advice. She pulled on a thick sweater and went out to Max's work truck, knocking on the passenger window. Dylan opened the door and pulled her into his arms, holding her tightly. Please don't ever do that again. Do what? Kelly's question was muffled against his shirt. Not answer your phone? It was off because I was sleeping, she explained. Giving up, she wrapped her arms around him and enjoyed the sensation of being held. I'm sorry, Kelly, he said. Why? I shouldn't have said that we should get a divorce like that. 
I should have talked to you first, discussed what you wanted to do. Dylan pulled away from her. Yes, you should have, Kelly answered, because I would have told you I wanted a chance to make this marriage work. You want to try? he asked, searching her face. Yes, she said firmly. Also, I think we need to go to counseling together. I know I have some issues from my previous marriage. Maybe we could both benefit from talking to someone. Talking didn't help Ren much, he shrugged, not having much faith in the idea. We aren't her. If we don't like the counselor we get, we will switch until we find one who's helping, Kelly suggested. Okay. Dylan reluctantly agreed. We still need to get that dog as well. Kelly smiled. Maybe this weekend? He nodded. I'd like that. A lovebird step away from the truck, Max grinned as he came up to them. Dylan took the house keys that Max returned to him. Thank you, Max, for everything. I'm batting two for two, you know. I'm thinking maybe switching my careers to matchmaker, Max said semi-seriously. Kelly groaned. I'm not sure the world is ready for you. You don't think so? Max ruffled up her hair. I know so, she replied, ducking away and holding on to Dylan. Too bad, I might have been good at it. Max smiled as he got into the truck. Stick to blowing stuff up, Dylan advised, keeping his arms wrapped around Kelly. Max gave them a wave as he drove away. The couple ignored him as Dylan kissed Kelly. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the epilogue of Reluctant Husband. Also, please like this video. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.